Well, good morning everybody. <clears throat> uh, welcome to our Thought for the Day this morning, wherever you're watching this, whether it's on Facebook Live now at half eight in the morning or whether it's um, on YouTube a bit later on. But uh, we welcome you this morning um, and I hope you've slept well, woken to a new day and uh, and God is, uh, you, know, you know, God's blessing upon you this morning. Um, and uh, we are looking uh, to just spend some time together around God's Word as always. Yesterday, of course, we finished our, our series on um, the Exodus and we looked at uh, just very briefly over a few days, didn't we, of, of, the, uh, of, of how Moses and God's great gospel plan was worked out uh, in a, gr a huge sermon, bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, rescuing them from Egypt and, all, and through the Red Sea and calling them to him. Now this morning and tomorrow we're just going to look at one verse. We're going to go from a huge scope of the whole of Exodus down to looking at one verse in Romans. So if you want to get your Bibles out and you want to follow me this morning, we're going to read from Romans chapter 15. And uh, the verse we're going to concentrate on is a wonderful verse, a wonderful um, piece of uh, nugget of scripture, if you like. Um, that, that Often Paul writes lots of these, doesn't he, in his letters and um, kind of encapsulates all the stuff that he's talking about in, 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 in other areas. And so this morning we're going to look at this particular uh, letter to the Romans. Um, it's probably his magnum opus, as they call it, is is, is, is uh, amazing, weighty letter to these Roman Christians who are uh, filled with doctrine and, and, and the explanation of what it means to be a Christian and uh, what it means to be a, a follower of Jesus, what it means and what um, what the cross actually did for us, what the sacrifice on the cross did for us, uh, justification by faith, huge things throughout this book, isn't there? And we're going to look, you know, for another time maybe, to look at all of the details of that, where, and um, many have done that before. But we're going to be looking at this, just one verse, Romans 15 and verse 13, but we're going to read the whole of, well, the first 13 verses of chapter 15 of Romans. So hopefully by now you've found it, and uh, you'll read along with me. But before we do that, uh, let's pray together, shall we? Let's ask God to bless our time in his word this morning. Father, we thank you for another new day. We thank you, Lord, for waking us refreshed after a night's sleep, I hope. Lord, we thank you that um, you do give us sleep, you do give us rest, you do provide for us. You're a God who looks after us. You're a God, you're a gospel God, a God who has good news for us, even in the most difficult of times, as we've been seeing over the past few weeks and Lord we thank you for that thank you that for what we're learning from you and through you Lord as you speak to us through your words through the power of your Holy Spirit and we pray that would be the same again this morning Lord as we come and we uh, submit ourselves to your word again Lord let it be an encouragement to us and, and a challenge perhaps as well as we seek to serve you in these days in these strange days that we live in so, Lord, we pray that you'd be with us today. Bless everyone who's joined us this morning. We pray for those who aren't, uh, aren't able to, maybe those particularly who are unwell today, Lord. We particularly lift them before you and ask that you'd be a special blessing to them wherever they may be at the moment and that you would raise them up again and let them know that you are their comfort and their hope and their joy and their peace in these days. And so, Lord, help us now as we come, come around your word. We ask this in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. Okay, Romans 15, verses 1 to 13. So um, if you want to read along with me. Um, so we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbours for their good, um, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of that, those that insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the, and through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, <clears throat> so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, 
Therefore I will praise you amongst the Gentiles. I will sing praises <coughs> of your name. Again it says, Rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples exalt him. And again, um, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse, that's Jesus, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise and rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. And then the verse we're going to look at this morning. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that God will bless his word to us this morning. So before we get into the verse itself, it's important we put it into a bit of context. We're going to look at this today and tomorrow. We're going to split it up a little bit because there's enough here for more than two days to be honest with you but we're going to look at just these couple of days these mornings together the context for them at that point in uh, paul is writing to romans christians from various traditions various places uh, jews and gentiles and of course this tension that was there all the time between the jews and the gentiles it was there in the early church it was there right the way throughout those early centuries that um, the Jews who had, had received Christ, he was one of theirs, as, as it were, born a Jew with, into, a, into David's line and uh, felt that there, there was a need to adopt many of the Jewish traditions and the Jewish uh, law and to, to apply that law as it was given in the Old Testament. And Paul's job here in Romans was to teach them that that wasn't the case. We are not justified and we are not made clean by obeying the law, but we're made clean by the grace of God, justified by his grace and his mercy and these as i say huge themes all the way through uh romans and of course this last chapter is uh, you may have got the gist at the beginning that the, the, it's, it's written against the background of division because of that those things the, you know the, the doctrines and this, the the uh, clash of cultures if you like uh, that was going on in rome was causing divisions in the church and so he said about accept one another live peace with one another it, it, we, we all worship and you know the, those ver verses quoted from isaiah and various other places <coughs> um about the gentiles uh being on, on equal par with the, the jews and uh, they would be the ones who would praise god and all the rest of it so you've got all of those things there. that's the backdrop of all of this so there was strong people there was weak people there was rich people there was poor people there um, and ultimately what Paul kicks off with right at the start of this letter is that he's confident in the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now it may be a difficult thing for you guys to accept, that's what he's saying, but I'm not ashamed of it and this is what it is and he spends the rest of the, the letter explaining it if you like. And he speaks here in these last few verses and particularly in this last verse that we, we, we were reading this morning about hope. Verse 13 talks about that he wants them to be um, overflowing with hope or uh, another another version, another translation of that, radiant with hope. Um, and, and that's what he wants for them. In the harsh realities of what life that they were dealing with, that he wants them to display hope. So I believe this is the reason I was drawn to this was because a few weeks ago, or maybe yeah, it was a couple of weeks ago now, I was listening to one of Alistair Begg, who we know, one of his sermons. And so this is a lot of this is based around what he said that that particular in that particular occasion. So um, I will you know, give due deference to him because I made notes on this because I thought it was so powerful that in this day and age, in, in these days, we need to be displaying hope, uh, not just having hope, but displaying hope. We should be sharing hope. And that's, I think, what the essence of this verse is, verse 13, that we read uh, together. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope, be radiant with hope, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so we not only want to have it ourselves, but we want to overflow. And Paul wanted that for the Romans in his day as well, uh, that, that they would... That, that, in the midst of all the troubles of their life at their time and the persecution and everything else that was going on that they would radiate hope they would be distinctive as christians in a world where there wasn't much hope that they would be distinctive in their hope makes the christians stand out peter says doesn't he in his letter is he we're looking at that on sunday mornings we read it last week that uh, well we'll be reading it in the weeks, weeks to come always be ready to give an answer and a reason for the hope that is resent within you it's, it's a real proper op opportunity for the gospel. As we, as we have hope in these troubled times, we can display that hope. It's not something we should just have for ourselves and keep it, but it is a, an opportunity to share hope 
where there isn't an awful lot around at the moment, as we'll see. So it's a distinguishing feature of every believer should be this hope that we have in God. And so for our context today, of course, we, we look at it, and this is, you know, we are living in historic times, aren't we? And, and although the things are just beginning to ease a little bit here, there's still this fear, isn't there, about how long is this all going to go on for? We might re release a little bit of the lockdown, we might get a bit more freedom, we might be able to do one or two more things. It was interesting, wasn't it, I read yesterday that Italian children in Italy, Italian young children, um, under the age of 10, it's specific, under the age of 10, are now allowed to hug their grandparents. I mean, what has the world come to? Where's the hope in a world like that where we have to dictate to children under 10 that they can today? Now, it, it's possible. We are saying you can hug your grandparents. There's just something very wrong about all of that, isn't it? That we have to tell people it's okay to do that. And we're all dealing with these things in our own situations, in our own homes, aren't we? And it all feels very insecure and very... Uh, it's, it's knocked away all the foundations that the world normally trusts in. And so in our context, people are needing... Well, is there going to be any hope from this? Are we going to have to live with this forever? You know, what is our hope in? Are we going to wait for the scientists to find a vaccine? Is that going to take a year or 18 months? Will there be some kind of other drug that will make the effects of this terrible sickness not uh, as bad? So if you do get it, you're more likely to survive it. You know, uh, what about all these people who are shielding, you know, three months in the house? But, you know, what happens when everyone else starts going back? Do we still have to be shielded? You know, what is... So it, 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 there's tremendous uh, worry and, and, and fear in this, all because a tiny, tiny particle, um, can't see it with the naked eye, have to have a proper electron microscope to see it, jumped from a bat into, a human, into various other animals and threw them into a human being, and in a matter of weeks has affected the whole world. It's unbelievable, isn't it? It's hard to imagine what it is and how leaders are trying to say we, we can you're trying to give people hope in these press conferences and saying that we can we can handle it and we'll get through this we'll all come through this it will end it will get over well yeah we want to we all want to believe that and i suppose we're all hoping that happens but what are we basing that hope on scientists might find a cure whatever i don't know all because of this tiny little particle isn't it the media don't help they breed fear don't they in, in people's hearts every 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 newscast is, is all about highlighting the worst cases and the most dramatic cases because that's what people will tune in for and uh this bad news bad news bad news is very little the, the good news is all about people who against all the odds have survived which is great of course it's wonderful news to see that but you know um there's there's no much balance in, in what we read. So most of us now, I think most people I speak to, said we hardly watch any news anymore. We, we're frightened of watching the news because it's just putting fear into us. And there is a fear, isn't it? So the media have done that. They have no answers or they have no hope. They just report that. And they would say they just report it as it is. One of the commentators said, at times like this, we realise just how powerful mankind is. Everybody's realising that. Nobody wants to talk about it, really. But everybody's realising how power, powerless we are. And the, the, the mantra for our government is we follow the science. We follow the science. Science is telling us to do this. Science is, is the god of this age. That's what we are going to do. Now, science is brilliant. Science is absolutely wonderful. And it's, it's an amazing discipline. And we can understand a lot through science, can't we? But can science save us? Can it really save us? Even the scientists say we can only give advice. It's the government that has to make decisions. And they're, 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 you know, we, we kind of want to pass the book. This is what we know from science, but we, we'd also um, put some kind of, you know, because there's a lot we don't know. That's what the, the problem with this virus is. There's so much we don't know, isn't it? And the NHS, we, we, we put our hope in the NHS. We just want to save the NHS. It's almost got religious qualities now, isn't it? We worship the NHS. We come out and worship it on a Thursday night and clap it. You know, I, I'm not decrying all of that, but this is what we're looking for somebody to save us. But when people go into hospitals, some people survive, and it's brilliant if that's the case. Uh, but the NHS, as an entity in itself, can't save us. Um, uh, some of the, some of the, many of the people who've gone into hospital have died. Sadly, they haven't been able to do that. And so, how can we have hope in all of these days? Where can we put our hope? Well, of course, our hope as Christians, what makes us distinctive, is Paul wants us to have this hope today that is in God. And we should be different to everybody else. God doesn't want us to just struggle on. He wants us to have hope despite our circumstances. So 
but it's important to realize that you know as Christians we shouldn't feel guilty if we don't feel that hope because we are human beings and and so it's it's important to note that even the best of us will grow distracted and worried and be and, and, and be worried and to be honest with you it would be a very strange do if we didn't because there's a I think there's a reality of the situation that we need to accept. It's no good going around saying God's got everything in his hands and everything and, and just pretending and whistling a happy tune and pretending this isn't happening to us because that's very insensitive to people who are really struggling. And really deep down, we are too. We're wrestling with these same things, aren't we? If we're honest. Uh, but we have a hope, but we do have hope where the world doesn't have hope. And that's what we want to look at in this verse this morning. And the reason we have this hope is because we believe in God. We believe that our worldview has a God who is at the centre of everything. And even in this pandemic and even in the troubled times we live, God is right in the middle of it. And he's in the author and finisher of our life. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He sustains it. He governs it. He writes his history. is his story. This is part of his story. And however difficult it may seem and, and arbitrary it may seem, Actually, we believe as Christians that there's a God who is there. And so therefore, there must be some purpose in it. There must be some uh, design in this. And eventually, God will, his will will be done in this situation on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we believe, isn't it? So we need to be careful, though, that we don't try and second guess what God's will is in all of this. And you get some people talking about this as God's judgment on the earth. And there's an element of that, certainly. Certainly, I think we could say this is God reminding his people, as he always does through everything, that you know, we aren't in control of our circumstances, that there are things that happen that are out of our control. When something like this can happen, it, it reminds us of that. It reminds us how, what did the commentators say? How limited we are as humanity. So um, we need to be careful we don't ascribe things to him that we shouldn't ascribe, shouldn't we really? So we shouldn't guess it. Luke 13 talks, doesn't it, in Luke 13 about a tower that falls and Jesus says, listen, be careful of this, because they say, was that God's judgment on those people? And Jesus just says, why, would, why are they any more sinful than anybody else? Why would God necessarily judge them? And it's not for us to know. But what's more important to know is that you know that there's a God and you, and you worship him and you get right with him. Because whatever he does is right. Um, and so kind of that's, that's the context he says. And Paul comes to the end uh, when he writes this amazingly when he writes this uh, amazing thesis, this amazing letter to all these Romans explaining the doctrines and everything. And he gets into lots of detail. But at the end of it all, when he talks about God's election and calling and, uh, and his, uh, he talks about his uh, God's will and purpose and his bigger picture, he says, he comes to the conclusion, who has known the mind of God? Chapter 11. Who has known the mind of God? Who is this, can help him understand things? So that's the context of everything, isn't it, really? So let's get into the verse. Let's do this quickly this morning as we, finish, as we bring things uh, towards the close. Paul's desire is, is it's, it, this is like a kind of prayer, isn't it, really? May the God of peace, we often say that, God bless you. I put that quite a lot at the end of emails and letters. Uh, may, may the Lord bless you. That's what he's doing. It's a kind of a, pre, a, 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 a prayer. He's got the same sort of prayer in verse 5 earlier up the, the chapter that we read. And it, it, but it's not a throwaway line. Paul really means this because this is what makes the difference. And because ultimately he wants them to have hope, abound in hope, overflow with hope, radiate hope. Okay. And the source of this hope, first of all, is God, isn't it? See verse 4. The scriptures will bring us hope. For, go back to verse 4 of, uh, of the chapter we just read. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide we might have hope. How do we get this hope? How do we know about the God of hope? It's through his word, isn't it? He's the God of hope. He's, and we're also going to look tomorrow at joy and peace as mentioned in this verse as well. They're all there. But he is the, he is the source of all of that. And therefore we need to look and understand about him. And God imparts, he gives himself to us through his scriptures. He doesn't just give us teaching about this. He doesn't just say, here's the textbook, go and read it. He comes himself through his word and teaches us in his heart. That's what Jesus said when we looked at before the uh, before Easter of the, the Holy Spirit's role, taking from what is mine and making it known to you. God gives himself. We will come and make our home with you, John tells us, doesn't it? The Father, Son and Spirit, 
God gives himself through his word. So as we read his word, as we understand it, as we feel, sense his presence in our heart through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit enlightens us and helps us to understand that God is the source of hope. Only he can give hope. We realise that only he can give hope. There's nothing else. So Jesus promised and his coming, we said we talk at Christmas about Emmanuel, God with us. And that's the truth. God is with us. So he's with you where you are this morning. He's with me where I am here. He's with us in this situation and he longs to bring, he is the source of hope. And while he is with us, we have hope. While we understand him, we have hope. Not just because he doesn't, he doesn't share some of that with us, he does. But ultimately we have hope because there is a God and he is at work and he is doing things. That's the bedrock and the source, if you like, of our hope. And he's not only the source of our hope, but he's the object of our hope. So we hope in him, don't we? Uh, psalm 73, it's a great psalm, isn't it? Illustrates this. The psalmist is, 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 is lamenting about all of his situation. And there's many horrible things going on in his life at this time. Horrible dangers and everything else. And then he kind of steps back in the middle of the psalm. And verse 23, downwards, if you read that psalm later on, and, and he goes, yet, yeah. he thinks, and he thinks of all these things, and then he thinks, he, he, he reminds, he speaks to himself, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, his word, and afterwards you will take me into glory. So that's the whole counsel, isn't it? You're with me. And he's thinking of these, yeah, but God, you're with me. You're at my right hand, you hold me, you guide me with your word and your wisdom and afterwards you're going to take me to glory. So I'm in safe hands is what he's saying. And so he then reflects again, who have I in heaven but you? On earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, which it will do in times like this at, at times, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion, not just for now, but forever. What a great psalm that is. We need to get hold of this, don't we? It's many people's favourites, isn't it? But those words, God is the strength of my heart and my portion. We, we think of ourselves, how long is this all going to go on for? Well, however long it goes on for, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The psalmist thinks of himself, who am I in heaven? Applying, he's applying what he's known. He's applying what's been imparted to him, what's given to him through the Holy Spirit, through God's word. He's reminding himself of God's word and his promises. And so he's uh, and the object of his hope. And in the context of God, this is what it is. We don't understand all of it, but God is before me. He's after me. He holds my hand through it and he'll, he instructs me in the ways and he will take me to glory one day. So he applies what he knows. And we have this hope. God says we'll have this hope forever in this way. We sing a hymn, don't we? All the way my saviour leads me. His forever, only his. It's true, isn't it? We are, it's not superficial. We are firm our, our hope because it isn't a whimsical thing. It isn't superficial. It's forever. So it's not just a general hope. Hope in the world is kind of a general hope. We hope that they'll do this. We'll hope they'll do that. I hope the weather's better based on whimsy. This hope is based on a reality. The reality of God being there and God's presence. So we we, we, we know hope and tomorrow we'll see we'll know peace and we can know joy because God is there and we can overflow with it, not just have it for ourselves, but we can overflow with it as well in this verse. We sing the hymn as well, don't we? There is, we've just learned it recently, but it's a wonderful, it's one of my favourites. There is our hope that stands the test of time, that, that, that guards against and stands with us uh, with the beckoning grave. But notice two words here that apply in this verse. We have this hope in believing, or as the, new, as the new international version, NIV puts it, as you trust in him. So there's a response we have to make to this hope, isn't there? It is there, whether we, whether we know it or not, whether we recognise it or not. God is our hope. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is there, and all these things we've said so far are true, but we have to respond in faith. It's not in our significance. Our hope isn't what in what in me. It's not in what I know. It's what not in my money. It's not in my relationships. All of those idols we're talking about, maybe we could have. It's not even in the science or the NHS or the government or anybody else. Our hope is in God alone, and that's what makes us different. All of these other things will fail us. Even the best of them 
will fail, science will fail, the government will fail, the NHS sometimes gets it wrong. Um, you know, uh, our money, of course, no matter how much money we've got, we can still be, uh, you know, it knows no boundaries, something like this, does it? Our relationships, even the closest, don't always work, do they? And they fail us. And we, uh, what's the best, uh, it's interesting, it, one of the best things we, the thing you hear all the time at the moment is the, is the encouragement to stay safe. Stay, it's the, where we sign our emails with and things, stay safe. And, but, but you know it doesn't tell us how we can stay safe there's no hope in that how do we stay safe how do we keep ourselves from trouble there's no solid foundation hope how, how will i do these things and paul's message here is vastly different isn't it he is a god who is there a rock a fortress every most of the psalmists talk about him now. a rock that is higher than i he's a fortress we can cling to in this storm of of, of uncertainty and hope will come and the reason the way we get this hope is in believing is in trusting in god in engaging with god's promise and his word promises in his word so f we begin with faith in the word of god this is god's word we believe god is here we trust in what he's saying so we engage with god's promise so we have faith comes from from hearing the word and faith comes from the, faith comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of god isn't it that's what paul also says earlier on in this in this letter so we our faith is in when we we need to know the word of god we need to remind ourselves so we start there if you're struggling to have hope this morning we start in god's word remind ourselves of what god has said like the psalmist but our hope comes from the fact that god will always fulfill his word that's the truth isn't it our faith comes in here's god who's given us a promise or his word and our hope is certain because god will fulfill his word now our hope in, in other things, they may give us a promise, they might say things to us and other people and other organisations and things, but we can't ever rely on them to fulfil everything that they'll ever say. But with God, it's different. So our faith goes into God because he's solid and he's secure and he's safe and he, he holds the world in his hands. And our hope is in, the, in that God because he will deliver on his promises, won't he? So he says to us, in John 14 I am going to prepare a place for you there's a promise and we build our faith on that that God has got this in hand and he's got a place for me and our hope is that when we get to heaven we will find that place perfect for us isn't it there Paul writes in Ephesians one of his other great letters 1 and verse 13 when you believed you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory so the Holy Spirit is our guarantee he will as we engage with God's word he will make it real in our hearts our hearts burn within us like those guys on the Emmaus road that's what God promises for us in his word in him um you heard and believed and were sealed with the holy spirit it's guaranteed as the holy spirit and so what god has promised he will deliver there's our hope this morning that's what sets us apart in the world of shifting sands and worries and care and and and, and we said the other day didn't we i think one of the illustrations we used in exodus was that all of us are in the sinking sand there's only one person who isn't it's god in christ and he's the only one who can pull us out and the only one who can rescue us it's an amazing picture, isn't it? When we heard, we believed. But the, 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 if we haven't believed, and the danger for the world who hasn't believed is this, Paul equally speaks of that in Ephesians again, chapter 2 and verse 12. Remember that at that time, this is before we, we came to Christ, at that time you were separate from Christ without hope and without God in the world. To be without God is to be without hope. That's Paul's graphic and, and very pointed statement this morning. Our only hope is in God. Without God, there is no hope. With God, there is hope. That's the truth this morning. And we can say that, but just think of the implications of that. That's what we offer to people. When we speak to people and when we overflow with hope, we offer something that they haven't got. They haven't got that certainty and we should have that, shouldn't we, in our hearts. Without God, we can't have hope. All we have is just a vague um, hope in, in, in things that may or may not let us down. Because ultimately, and, and, and ultimately everything will let us down, because ultimately all this fear and all this worry that we have around this, this, this virus comes down to one thing, and it's the fear of death, isn't it? It's the fear of death. And can 
these people who I want to put my hope in conquer it? Can, can the, 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 the scientists find a cure can that, so to keep me from dying? Well, maybe for the moment they can, but it can't forever, can they? We listen to the news, the pundits, and we, we listen to everything else, and they pontificate about it, but can they save me? Can they help me? Can they conquer death? We've got an answer for that. What we need to do is listen to that and then go to our Bible. And we see there the God who has conquered death, who holds the keys of life and death, doesn't he? Peter talks about being born again to a living hope. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Why? Because he has conquered death. So we said, we, death is my enemy. Death is the thing that I'm really worried about here. At the back, back of my mind, that's what I'm worried about for me and my family and everything else. And it's painful and all the rest of it. How can I deal with that? We have a hope because Christ has risen from the dead. It goes back to Easter, doesn't it? And that's where it is. Is there anyone out there who's conquered death and dealt with it? Yes, there is. Only Jesus. Nobody else has. Nobody else has got the answer except him, hasn't he? It's the resurrection. It's where our hope is found in Christ alone. I will be kept, not by my strength or by my goodness or by my witness, uh, by my wisdom, but we'll be kept in God, won't we? Because my life is hidden with Christ in God. What a wonderful promise for us. That's where our hope. And you'd think with hope like that, you think everybody would be running to church and running to the scriptures to find that hope, wouldn't you? The, the joy and the peace and and. And the, and the um, hope that we're talking about this morning is, is, is there, isn't it? You'd think people would be running for that, but we don't. We reject it, but there is a message we have to share. And that's the hope of Christ and the joy and the peace as we'll see tomorrow. So it's meant to radiate from us, isn't it? It's meant to overflow with joy. And this is the point. We don't keep this to ourselves. We have a hope to share. We have a story to share of our hope. It's not, and we don't have to share, well, this is how I deal with it, and talk about ourselves. It's not my hope. It's not because I'm good and I've gone, well, I great because I've got this hope and you haven't. We go back, we point people to the scripture and say, this is the God of hope. And he helps me. When I, when I wobble and when I struggle, I go back to the scriptures and remind myself. I don't go to the news and I don't go to the scientists and I don't go to anywhere else. I go to the scriptures because that's where my rock, I find him there. Jesus is there. And the Holy Spirit uses God's word and imparts it to me. Christ gives me himself again and gives me hope and gives me joy and gives me peace as we'll see tomorrow. But we, as I say, if we're going to have this hope to share, it has to be in us first. So how is your hope this morning? How's your hope? How's your joy? How's your peace? We'll look at them tomorrow. Are you overflowing with that? This is not to make us feel guilty. We don't work harder. We don't have to do something different here. We have to go back to So what I'm calling, what, what I believe... Paul is calling us to do here is to go back to where you find your hope and you won't find it anywhere else but in God's word the scriptures that give us hope what was it you said in verse 4 of this this chapter that we read this morning uh, uh, this morning again for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide we might have hope Romans 15 verse 4 comments on Romans that the reason Paul can pray that prayer at the end is because God has given us himself so when we're struggling when we feel afraid when we're wobbling go back to God's word and remind yourself of what you know and apply it to your heart well I hope that's helpful again this morning let's pray together shall we father we thank you for your word to us again today we thank you that we can have a hope in you and lord we confess that we all wobble and uh, Lord, we all struggle and you understand that. Uh, Lord, you gave us the example of that. Remember in the garden, Lord, whether it was a wobble or whatever, we wouldn't call it. But you said uh, you struggled with the fear and of, of what we, or the worry about what was going to happen. And you struggle like we do. Lord, if it's possible to take this from us, please do it. And we'd all pray that about now. But Lord, we thank you that you said you also said not my will, but yours. Trusting that you have a purpose and a plan in it all. And there was a hope there. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand that hope for ourselves this morning. So today when we wobble, today when we fear, today when we're worried about our families and friends, that we would go back to your word and remind, of ourse remind ourselves of you and your hope that's within us. And so Lord, we thank you again for the encouragement through your word this morning. We pray you bless it to our hearts and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.
Thank you for joining me this morning. It's great to have you with us. Um, have a great day today. Enjoy whatever you're going to do. Um, uh, we're coming towards the end of another week, the sixth week in lockdown. One more day of thought for the day tomorrow, half past eight. I'll see you here then. Over the weekend, don't forget, just a flat heads up on Saturday evening. I think it's about half past seven, we said. I'll, I'll send you an email out to those at Trinity. We're going to have a quiz night. Janice is sorting that out for us, but we're going to meet the, uh, online and we'll do a quiz and we'll have a wonderful time together with that on Zoom. So well, I'll send you the information for that. Uh, that will be great if those of you who can join us on that. Um, we'll try and work out a way for those who aren't with us to have a copy of that and join in in other ways. But ideally, try and get yourself on Zoom and we'll all enjoy it together. And then Sunday, we'll meet for worship as usual on uh, Sunday morning at half past ten. Uh, again so thank you again for being with us this morning hope this message has been of help meet see you tomorrow morning god bless have a lovely day